In Dead Space 3 exists a cunning answer to Homo sapiens' natural observation skills by the necromorphs. Typically what you see running amok is a creature that looks nothing like a human, which would tell any survivor to run in the opposite direction. Due to this, these survivors may be harder to track down long term by the necromorphs, which in turn could form somewhat of a resistance. However, seeing as we have covered versions of necromorphs in the past that seemingly lure humans in, it's becoming quite apparent that variants are formed to specifically trick a human senses and lead them towards their own destruction. One in particular is a variant who completely retains their human form and could very easily trick surrounding non-infected people. So today, I bring you the Dead Space 3 Fodder Necromorph, Morphological Oversight or Intentional Trick. The Fodder is an interesting case of Necromorph. Morphologically speaking, very little has changed about it from its original human host, but surface level often doesn't show the full story. As we all know, many changes are structurally made to humans after they begin undergoing the necrotizing process. In this case, the fodder is different, but it still does undergo this necrotizing process. But before we get to that, let's first attempt to understand why these creatures seem to show up so late in the fight. First, the Brethren Moons are not stupid creatures, nor are they unaware of what makes a species vulnerable. It can be assumed psychologically that many species who have advanced up the technological tier scale would have an us versus them mentality. The reality is, is this is almost a natural basis for life. For a particular species to advance, socially you must identify with your own species and work together against some common difference or threatening problem. Now that doesn't have to be others who don't look like you, it could be something as simple as a saber toothed tiger or the elements. But usually, for a species to actually conquer their planet, they must work together. The Brethren Moons would understand this social ability fairly innately since they themselves are going to refer to each other as brothers, which hints at their own social ties. Regardless, using the idea of a single species working together, the fodder is an answer to making that species drop its guard. Over the eons and epochs, the Brethren Moons have systematically wiped out all life after presumably seeding it first. Much like the Reapers and Mass Effect who control the evolution of a species using the relays, dropping the black markers on a planet allowed for the Brethren Moons to heavily influence the evolution of a particular dominant animal, which in turn gave them innate knowledge of what would make them tick and how this particular animal may react to certain events. Circling back to humans, we see that the fodder is unaltered based on their outward appearance, sporting all the standard human traits, two legs, a single torso, two arms, shoulders, a head, all their anatomically correct positions as well. This would essentially yield a creature capable of moving much like a human does, but also potentially moving around completely unnoticed. The human brain is fantastic at patterns, if you didn't know. We tend to see faces on planets despite it just being shadows. We see reoccurring numbers sometimes despite them being completely random. We even completely phase out movement sometimes times in our peripheral vision if we believe it subconsciously to not be a threat. This is where the fodder begins to score most of its game-ending hunts. Imagine you're on Tal Volantis. You know there are monsters running around taking out people left, right, and center, but you have only seen them as heavily altered humans. You and your group move through a base trying to survive and you happen to see a human shape in your peripheral vision. This is not what you're looking for, so you approach them looking around at the vents and other areas for the real threat. You get right up on the person and basically pull them into your group then the thing turns around and plants an axe right into your head, taking you out of the game instantly. This is the purpose of the fodder. It lures humans to their demise. The fodders on Tau Volantis are actually fairly easily explained. The planet was subject to snow and heavy storms. Any person out on the surface would have extremely poor visibility. Because of this, any human shape running around on the surface would be assumed to be just that, a human. This would heavily play into the fodder's favor because the humans of Tau Volantis were also heavily armed themselves. This armature meant that any creature creature that outright showed its true form would be completely decimated by the weapons the soldiers had at their disposal. So subterfuge was preferred in some variants to allow the necromorph to get closer. This would be invaluable in the conversion process and would speed things up quite a bit. But hold up, what about the fodders on the ship? There was no snow there. Or you know the fodders that were made out of people in the lunar city? Well, you know your boy has an answer for that one as well. And of course, it's based on the markers using context clues throughout the game. If you take a look at Tau Volantis, the planet, markers are quite literally everywhere. The species there had built millions of them. Their influence was strong across the entire planet. So strong, in fact, that the effects could more than likely be experienced even in low orbit, which is exactly where most of the scaf ships were located. Jumping over to our neck of the woods to the lunar colony, it's pretty clear that unitology at this point was beginning to overwhelm the local government there. I mean, they even had Jacob Danik's stupid face plastered on a giant blimp, spouting nonsense about the age of man being over. With unitology spreading faster than it was 
was able to be controlled and the Earth Ghost soldiers being systematically slaughtered, I think it's safe to assume that at this point the markers were all over the moon and more than likely all over Earth as well. So we are about to enter the realm of hypotheticals at this point, but if you follow the clues as to how the markers operate, it does make pretty good sense, at least in my opinion. As we all know, the markers put out a signal and this signal in turn is basically just energy. This energy can restructure your cells post-mortem and drive you insane while you're alive, leading you to bringing down others as well as yourself, thus adding to the population of the necromorphs. Now I believe that what you would turn into is predicated on two things, distance from the marker and the amount of markers. Think of it this way, if you have a centralized Wi-Fi router in a large house, it puts out a signal but the further you are away, the weaker it is. Now imagine you have multiple Wi-Fi routers throughout the entire house. The signal would be strong no matter where you are. Probably a similar thing with the markers. When humanity was near the black marker, it influenced our evolution rather than turning us. If we got too close, you could still turn into an infector, but overall the signal was pretty weak. Fast forward to the future, markers are everywhere. No matter where your location, the signal courses through your body, and not just from one, but from multiple. This is where we get the fodders. As stated previously, the Brother Moons are not stupid. They know what makes you, you. As the signal strength increases and the body is exposed to stronger doses as humans continue to build more and more markers for religious purposes or energy, at least in their minds, the markers would almost get smarter. Perhaps this is a self-limiting technique built into the actual markers themselves so that a species that's roughly a few hundred thousand doesn't overbuild markers right out of the gate, wasting the Brethren Moon's time. No, it starts out simple enough with just a few markers which yields infectors, slashers, leapers, the really small guys initially. If enough time passes with just one marker, larger necromorphs can be created as seen on the Ishimura. When many markers are built, this yields all the previously mentioned necromorphs faster as seen on Tideman Station. When the markers are built in mass, it begins yielding newer forms of necromorphs designed to trick humans simply because it has reached a stage where it is powerful enough to reanimate bodies quickly and with a purpose besides just hacking and slashing. So this is my hypothesis on why these creatures exist only now, but what changes have happened to the host? Glad you asked. Let's get to it. Morphologically speaking, the fodder as stated has a human silhouette. This is by design and on purpose. The host has retained many of its features including a similar mass to when it kicked the bucket, unlike the feeders we see on the planet. One thing should be noted however is that the face of this creature has essentially fallen off or is completely exposed muscle. The eyes glow a yellow color with the mouth dripping the same substance. If you watched any of my other videos, you know that this is the infection medium used to turn humans into different variants of necromorphs. Whether they be exploders, infected infants, or infectors themselves, this bacteria shows up across the board and has many capabilities. But I wanted to point out two things that I find oddly strange about these creatures considering their outward appearance is not that abnormal. When a human is turned into any other form of necromorph, their rig system shows that they are completely flatlined. But oddly enough, on some of the fodders, their rig will actually glow red, suggesting that there may be some internal function still happening to signal to the rig that they are somewhat still alive. What is this indicator of life? I'm going to go on a limb and I believe it's actually the brain. Looking at the head of a fodder, it is clearly intact, which no doubt it's still swimming in yellow bacteria. The brain is still in its original form. This being the case, it's actually seen in certain parts of the game that maybe the brain is still there. Some fodders can be seen shirking their weapons from their previous life to pick up hand held weapons. This gives them an understanding or seems to suggest they have an understanding that they are naturally not tremendously successful offensive beings. So they will pick up a handheld weapon. This would show that their mind should be working to some capacity. They would be understanding planning, forethought, how a weapon works, what the axe, baton, crowbar, or ice pick are used for, and how to use it against non-infected. This in turn requires thought. While a very primitive version of thought, much like an ape picking up a leg bone and smacking another with it, this could be interpreted by the rig of that person as alive despite the grievous wounds they have and really the probability that the heart is no longer beating. All these low level bodily functions are taking place despite the expiration of the host. Whether or not though the brain is functional however, it's almost irrelevant. As seen with the exploders and their talking or the wall guardians and their screaming, they too seem to be conscious but they are not in the driver's seat. The same can be said for the fodder. A second mind exists in the lower body of the fodder and it controls the upper brain, which uh, actually isn't too far from how humans interact now. Anyhow, the consciousness almost seems to wear the upper body like a suit. Tentacles sprout out, reaching into the upper body,
body and a central tentacle, which is presumably made out of the spine and spinal cord, is going to be the main pillar in the body. The two side tentacles would need to be made out of the bones inside the body, such as from the ribs or pelvic material. These three spines operate the body like a puppet. When you destroy the upper body, the tentacles will reveal themselves. There are actually a few forms that this creature can take. If the upper body of the fodder is destroyed, the tentacles will pop out of the pelvic region and control the legs. It will run towards you and begin using its powerful hits in an attempt to take you out. Should the legs be destroyed, the tentacles will come out of the upper body and dig into itself and throw sharp projectiles if you're far away or kind of do this creepy arachnid crawl towards you, which is horrifying. These hit with a fair amount of force though and can cause quite a bit of damage if you aren't careful. Overall though, the fodder will choose to attack you with physical force given the opportunity. Speaking of attack, the fodder favors some pretty lethal weapons. And by the way, fodder favors is kind of a tongue twister. While its counterparts may use bone to attack humans, which is fairly effective, the fodder tends to rely on heavy metal. These weapons that it picks up could be preferred for two reasons. The one mentioned previously stating that there is an understanding of how weapons work, or it could just be as simple as they were frozen to the hands after certain individuals just fell where they were and rigor mortis was set in, allowing them to almost become part of the body of this creature. Though the latter wouldn't explain why other variants will drop their weapons to pick up handheld weapons or retrieve these weapons from fallen humans. So, how do you game end it, and how does it game end you? Well, should the fodder have eaten its Wheaties that morning, or Isaac just wants to commit the not alive, the fodder will use the axe or crowbar or baton to slice Isaac's arm off. This basically sends you into shock immediately, but it's not done. Before the blood loss sets in entirely, Isaac will fall over. The creature will then begin disemboweling Isaac with its weapons, which spells game over for him. Now, let's be real here. Isaac is 40 years of age, too old for this, eight days from retirement, and has got a whole lot of nerd rage built up. He will shove the fodder off of him, knocking it down. But I'd like to think Isaac has been playing some Gears of War because at this point, he will curb stomp the creature, completely decapitating it with his foot. Truly, this man is not playing around, so you better get back. So, here's a question. Why is the fodder also named a waster? I have no idea. But, uh, who wants to call them waster? Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, we all know the drill. Hit that like button as it feels my insatiable ego, but actually helps the video. If you are new and enjoyed it, I've got like literally 40 other Dead Space videos, so hit that sub button. Here, here's a random one right here. And don't forget to hit the notification bell to get notified when I do post more. I will drop my Twitter, Discord, and Patreon links in the description if you are interested in hitting up any of those. And we were supposed to do a trial run on this, so I hope this guy's not mad, but uh, I think it works now, so we we're gonna just dive feet first. Your boy has got that merch. So if you are interested in picking up any shirts, or I believe I have pop sockets for some reason, uh, you can get it in the link in the description. Anyways, I would like to thank my patrons, of course, because they're absolutely brotastic. So our first astronaut is the man, the myth, the legend, Joseph Givens. Thank you for your patronage, bro. And next up, it's Not A Spoon. Also a total unit. Thank you for yours as well, my guy. And then next up, it's Laffy No Skill, who has been around for eight months at this point. Thank you for your patronage as well, my dude. Then we got the man known as Mom Spaghetti at the astrophysicist level. A thank you to you as well. Next up, our four scientists. Our first one is Arulam Lupe. And next up, we have RTM Shornage. Then it's Zach Krieger. And lastly, it's A. Laurentis. Thank you, guys. Our solo resident is going to be Punished Meat. With their PhD in genetics, we have Allison Casparo, Andrew Lawson, and Divine Whisper. Holding it down with their Master's in Biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Cameron Smith, Cough Syrup, Edgy McGee, Mr. Poifish, Pendleton 115, Stutz, The Wren of Lies, and The Otter Man. And last but not least, with their Bachelor's in Morphological Sciences, we have Add to the List, Ahigao Comics, Alex the Gun Guy, Anthony Wolf, Captain Gas Mask, Dustin Ellis, Eric Scott Gillies, Fruit Eater, Icarus, Cobb McHenry, Marcus Wall, Molten Tarts, Professor Bennett's, Riot, Russell McBride, The Original Fat, Trixie Lula Moon, and Ulf Hednar 845719. Thank you guys. Okay, so we all know it's coming. Finals. To all you in high school and college currently, everyone good luck on your finals. Detrimental to my career on YouTube, but stop watching YouTube. Go get some studying done. You can binge in the summer, but also remember to take breaks though. Every 15 minutes per hour, it'll help you avoid burnout. Anyhow, thanks for watching guys. I hope everyone enjoyed and I will see y'all in the next one.